drafted. I spoke it when he was called up. I'm going to speak it now that he's been celebrated on baseball's biggest stage. Good morning to you. Good Wednesday morning. I'm Dan Kovacevic of DK Pittsburgh Sports, and this is Daily Shot of Pirates. It comes your way bright and early every weekday if you're into football and or hockey. I also offer daily shots of Steelers and Penguins in the same place that you found this. American League 5, National League 3 in the All-Star Game last night in Arlington, Texas, and nobody cares about that. Everyone around here would care how both of the Pirates fared, of course. Paul Skeens pitched a scoreless first inning with one strikeout, one walk to Juan Soto, and nobody even minded that because it gave him a chance to retire Aaron Judge on a ground out to third. 16 pitches, 11 strikes. Brian Reynolds went one for two, singled in his first at bat in the seventh inning, struck out for the final out of the evening. And along the way, between the five zillion cameras and flash bulbs going off as Skeens pitched, between all the glowing commentary and peer reviews and everything else that was happening for Skeens, not to mention the earlier red carpet gala in which he and his girlfriend Livy Dunn made the predictable big splash, a star, an actual star, was born. And believe it or not, I'm not talking about nationally, or at least not just nationally. I believe that a star was born in Pittsburgh. We are, and longtime listeners and readers can attest I've brought this up often over the years, an event town. We are an event town. My friends, we have an event this weekend here in downtown Pittsburgh called Picklesburg. It's a food festival that's somewhat based on pickles that offers some interesting stuff, but nothing super exciting. And yet we will pack every millimeter of our golden triangle for this event. Why? Because it's an event. It's what we do. Someone says there's an event. We all go. Now the pirates, of course, haven't been an event in our city for quite some time. Oh, they're over there. They're across the river and they're available 81 81- times a year, but an event means, you know, a reason to get excited, a specific thing, something that you circle on your calendar. They haven't been that in way too long. This is different. This, I believe, is the end of Skeens being just another pitcher in the rotation as far as being an attraction to the gate. And if I'm being blunt here, that's what he's been. I mean, yeah, there's been some uptick in attendance whenever he pitches, but we're talking about one of the three smallest ballparks in the majors, and we're talking about exactly one game having been sold out that he's pitched. And that game was a few days ago against the Mets a Friday night with fireworks and with lots and lots of those tickets having been bought by visiting New Yorkers. Because that's how it goes when the Mets are here on a weekend, same as when the Phillies are here on a weekend. They will make their way across the Commonwealth, and they will take up a certain portion of the stadium. So as I see it, that ballpark has yet to be filled up with Pittsburghers for Skeens even once. I think that's over. I do understand that there are going to be challenges That it's not like plotting a concert and booking a hotel because you don't know the next time he's going to pitch. Right now, actually, we can't even guess at the next time he's going to pitch because my belief is that they're going to use this all-star break and the fact that he was out there last night to buy him a few extra days and slow down that rising inning count so that nobody has to prepare for the awful circumstance in which he'd get shut down at season's end before, you know, the playoffs. So that part's tough. If I want to see a concert, if I want to see the circus, I know the date. I can circle it. I can do all of my planning. One of the top questions that comes our way at DK Pittsburgh Sports, notably on our site, is when is the next time he's pitching? When's the next time he's pitching? Do you know this? I had a friend of mine, a good friend in California, ask me recently if if I had any idea if and when Skeens was going to pitch at Dodger Stadium in several weeks. Like, I have no idea. I don't know what he's doing this weekend. 
But that's the kind of anticipation that's going to build up. That's the kind of ticket tension that's going to build up. That's not a me term. That's an executive term. Sports executives use that. When they build up enough advanced sales, whether it's through season tickets or group sales or even an anomaly like this, an in-season anomaly like this, people suddenly begin to get nervous that there won't be a ticket available for them, as opposed to just saying, eh, you know what, I'll just get one when I get one. And then they start talking about that in the office with their co-workers, and their co-workers start talking about it with somebody else. And the next thing you know, we have dot, 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 an event, an event in Pittsburgh, and we're all going to go. In fact, we might even see the event become so intensive that you start just buying up tickets for two games. I've heard people do this already. Uh, This is more prevalent when Jared Jones was pitching because you figure, well, I'm not going to see one, but I'll definitely see the other or one of the two. So maybe even while Jones is out, you go, all right, well, Mitch Keller is going to be pitching in there somewhere. So you start buying up tickets. And I know what you're thinking. As long as I'm talking about people buying tickets and giving money to the Pirates, you're thinking about giving it to Bob Nutting and how Nutting, in turn, should make sure that Ben Charrington is spending the money which he's already been allotted to make sure that the team is better. Because that's the other thing that happens by the pirates being put on this stage secrets out expectations are raised time to play ball time to be a legit event when we come back j1q this portion of daily shot of pirates is brought to you by our friends at north shore tavern that's directly across federal street from pnc park it's home of steak on a stone an eating experience, underscoring the word experience. The steak is brought to you partially cooked on an 800 degree stone and you do the rest. It's a ton of fun, it's a great meal, and it's a baseball atmosphere like no other in Pittsburgh. North Shore Tavern, right across Federal Street from PNC Park. Today's J1Q segment, I'm going to instead respond to a lot of your responses yesterday when I challenged listeners to come up with a name other than Garrett Cole that the Pirates under Bob Nutting didn't keep or didn't succeed in signing to a longer-term extension, the kind that I laid out as the template, meaning they're younger You sign them through their arbitration years, and you tack on a year or two of what would have been their free agency years. A lot of the names that I got, and I say this respectfully, didn't fit this at all. Like, I think Edinson Volquez came up at one point. Well, Volquez, if he was an impact, it was when he was a younger pitcher in Cincinnati. He was an older guy by the time he got to the Pirates. There was a reference to Francisco Liriano. Liriano was signed, but was dumped off in that ridiculous deal with the Blue Jays that was a a blatant money disposal. But there again, that doesn't fit. Frankie came here as a veteran. Joe Musgrove was probably as close as anybody came. And I did mention Joe in yesterday's episode. The reason that I don't really take... Joe all that seriously in this specific context is that when Ben Charrington was brought aboard, it was understood that he was going to be selling off almost entirely the veterans or even some of the mid-range, mid-age guys that he had to try to stock up on prospects. So Musgrove was dealt in a trade that turned out to be better from a return standpoint, I thought, than the Garrett Cole trade. But he was never going to be one of those long-term signees. That was just understood at the time. So what I'm trying to say here is that nobody came up with one. The only name, the only example that anyone can reasonably cite, given the parameters that I'm laying out here, of a player who was seen as a star-type guy who wasn't kept who wasn't signed to one of these contracts, is Cole. That's it. It's Cole. End of list. 
Whereas the list of those who were signed to such contracts were Andrew McCutcheon, Starling Marte, the still promising version of Gregory Polanco, the still non-scumbag version of Felipe Vasquez, at least as far as anybody knew at the time, and then under Charrington, in order, it was Cabrian Hayes, Brian Reynolds, and most recently, Mitch Keller. You can say a lot of things about Nutting as an owner, a lot of negative things about him as an owner. I do so on a regular basis, but I also don't need to manufacture phony narratives to get it done. One of the very few things that he's done very well as an owner is to keep these types of players. I had someone send me something interesting yesterday that said, don't you feel like when you bring up stuff like this, DK, that you're uh, rolling your readers under the bus because the perception is so overwhelming, to which all I have to say is I, I'm not worried about what a perception is. I'm just worried about what's accurate. If the listeners or the readers have an inaccurate perception of something, something that's demonstrably, provably inaccurate, I'm just supposed to go along with it so I don't make anybody mad? What is that? I appreciate the question. I appreciate everybody listening to Daily Shot of Pirates. We're going to do another one of these tomorrow. 